Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. My name is V and in this video I'll be sharing with you how to successfully get into Imperial College London. Some of the topics that I'll be covering in this video include some of the typical grade requirements, your personal statement, reference letters and also the interview process. For a bit of context, the course that I applied to was BSc Medical Biosciences in 2017 and then I continued on to do my masters also at Imperial in Genes, Drugs and Stem Cells, Novel Therapies and I applied for that in 2020. Just a quick disclaimer before I start the video, I just wanted to say that I'm not part of the Imperial Admissions team or anything like that. All of what I'm saying is just based on my experience and what I felt have worked for me. I think a question that most people are generally quite curious about is how hard is it to actually get into Imperial College London? And I think the answer to that differs slightly for each course. If we're looking at the overall statistics from 2019 to 2020, the number of applications received per admissions placed was 8.5 for undergraduates and 7.2 for postgraduates. Courses like computer science are much more competitive because they have an applications to admissions ratio of 20 to 1, whereas most engineering and biology related courses have an application to admissions ratio of around 7 to 1. This is not to say that the higher the ratio, the better the course. This data can vary from year to year and some courses just take in far less students compared to other courses, which makes it a little more competitive. Also, I hope that I'm not putting you off already because even though the numbers might seem a little bit daunting, there are ways to increase your chances of getting in. So let's start off with subject choices and grades. Right off the bat, typical grade requirements lie between three A's and A star, A star, A for your A level. A levels is a standard exam that you normally take here in the UK when you're usually between 16 to 18 years old. Students normally take four AS subjects in their first year and then cut it down to three A2 subjects in their second year. But for many of the people that I've personally met at Imperial, many actually continue on to take four A2 subjects. This is because Imperial is a STEM university, so the majority of courses are engineering related, meaning that most people would probably take two sciences, which usually consists of chemistry, physics, or biology, and then two math subjects, which is usually pure maths and further maths. If you don't do A-levels, that is completely okay. Imperial also accepts a range of qualifications from different countries, and I've included the link for that down below in the description box, so feel free to check it out if your country doesn't really follow the UK education system. The grade requirements for each course differ slightly, so usually for biology-related courses, the minimum grade requirement is three A's. For engineering-related courses, Courses, it's usually one A star and two A's, but the grade requirements might differ a little bit depending on how many A level subjects that you actually take. And also your predicted grades play a role in what the university might offer you if you get accepted. So for example, if you were predicted to get three A stars, obviously your chances of getting in are higher, but even though the website may state that the minimum requirement is one A star and two A's, and if you put in your UCAS application that your predicted grades are three A stars, the university might require you to achieve those three A stars in order for you to get in. So even though you have higher predicted grades and that might increase your chances earlier on in the application, make sure it's just realistic for you to actually achieve that by the end of the day. I've also linked the list of 2022 courses available at Imperial down in the description box below, so you can feel free to check that out if you're interested in looking at the minimum grade requirements for the course that you're interested in. I would say that the grades listed on the Imperial website are sort of the bare minimum because most people that are admitted normally get a grade that's higher than that. But that's not to say that you need to achieve like four A stars in order to be admitted. There are other aspects of your application that also play a huge role, like your personal statement, reference letter, and potentially interview. It's just that most people who do apply to Imperial will already have a good grade. So in order to increase your chances of getting in or getting shortlisted to the interview, it's better to have a higher predicted grade. If you're curious to know some of the grades that Imperial students get, you could always check this out on LinkedIn and just search up some of the current Imperial students or Imperial alumni. Some of them may include their grades in their profile, but some of them may not. So this can sort of give you an idea of the ballpark that you want to aim for. If you would like any specific advice on the course that you're interested in, you could always try to just drop them a message. Not everyone will reply, but if you do get lucky, you might just land someone who's really helpful and might give you a lot of useful information for your application process. In terms of how to actually achieve good grades, I think there are many really helpful YouTube videos out there. Some of my favorite YouTubers are Ali Abdal and Jaded Jade, and of course our lord and saviour Khan Academy. 
But if I were to narrow down my top two tips for studying for your A-levels, it would be to practice learning through active recall and also just to do a ton and a ton of past year papers. Your subject choices is also really important and I really believe that you need to make your subject combinations make some sort of sense. If, for example, you want to pursue chemical engineering, it might not be the wisest decision to take English literature, chemistry, physics, and then economics. Like, it might work, but the chances are slim. And from a recruiter's point of view, it might just look like you don't really know what you want to do and you're just trying out a bunch of different things that you think you enjoy or you think that you're good at. If you're considering pursuing a STEM degree at top universities, it's important that most, if not all, of your subjects are related to science. This is not just to please the recruiters, because if you don't have sufficient background in science, you will really struggle to catch up during lectures and sort of understand what on earth is going on. So that might make things a little bit difficult for you down the line, so choose your subjects wisely. With that being said, you don't necessarily need to take the typical two sciences and two maths for your A-levels. Personally, my four A-level subjects were biology, chemistry, math, and art. Now, art might seem rather irrelevant, but I use that anomaly to my advantage to talk about it during my personal statement. In a way, I talked about how my observational skills and also attention to detail when I would be drawing during art class and how this was translatable to what I would do in the lab in, say, a science-related course. Personally, for the course that I applied to, I wasn't required to do an admissions test, but many of the Imperial courses do require some sort of admissions test. For example, if you apply to medicine, I believe it was BMAT, and then for other engineering-related courses, I'm not sure, but I think some of them are like math-related admissions tests like STEP, so be sure to score really well in those as well and definitely don't neglect that because I feel like that aspect is something that many students neglect because a lot of people tend to focus so much on studying for your A-level subjects which is of course extremely important but that means that the people who actually do put in the extra effort to study really hard for their admissions test will stand a much higher chance of getting shortlisted to the interview. So be sure that not only that your A-level grades are good but prepare well for the relevant admissions test that you need to take. You can find information on this on the Imperial website for each specific course. The deadline for each admissions test might be slightly different and also the type of admissions test also might be slightly different. So just make sure to do your research well. Next up is writing your personal statement. Now I'll be releasing a more detailed video on this later on so keep an eye out if you're interested for that. But in this video I'll just be narrowing down my three top tips. So just to start off, a UCAS personal statement is 4,000 characters and that is about an A4 page and a little bit. So, not a lot of words to use. Tip one is to never start off your personal statement with something like, since the age of two I had a passion for science and at the age of 12 I found the cure for cancer. Like immediately when someone reads that, the recruiter will instantly call you out on your BS because that's just extremely unrealistic and it's okay not to actually know what your true passion is or what career you want to pursue 10 years down the line. I personally believe that passion is something that can be developed over time through the different experiences that you go through. But in your personal statement, you need to at least show some evidence of having thought through what is it that you want to pursue and also express a desire to study a subject that really sparks your interest. Tip number two is to start planning your personal statement during the summer. Now I know that summer is a time for relaxing and just chilling out, but it doesn't hurt to just spend a couple of days just brainstorming some of the things that you want to include in your personal statement. You don't know the number of people that I've seen that just scrambled their personal statements in the last couple of days before the deadline. and. It might work for some people, but for the majority of us, I'd say that planning definitely gives you a bit of an advantage. If you're applying to Imperial, you most likely want to apply for Oxbridge as well, and the deadline for that every year is on the 15th of October, which is much earlier than the deadlines for any other university. So if you think about it in that sense, you don't actually have a lot of time to write your personal statement because once classes start and everything, things will be extremely hectic during your A2 year, so it's always better to have a head start. At this point, you don't need to have something that's perfectly structured, just brain dump any of the things that you might find relevant, so any of the experiences that you might have had. It doesn't necessarily need to be like a really long work experience or internship, but maybe an online course that you might have signed up that's relevant to the subject that you want to apply for, a seminar that you attended in school, a book that you read, just anything that you might find relevant, whether it's academic or non-academic, you can start just listing that out and the structure can come later. 
I wrote at least five drafts before submitting my final personal statement onto UCAS. This went through several teachers for feedback. And you need to consider that teachers are also human beings with many other responsibilities and deadlines of their own. So you need to also give them a bit of time and leeway in order to read your personal statement and then give you the feedback in time. And then you also need a lot of time to edit that and just make a ton of tweaks and the final version. So all of this is just a lot of time that isn't really accounted for, so it's always better to have a head start. And tip number three is that it is okay to brag about yourself. That is what a personal statement is for. Now I know that many of us might find it a bit like iffy to start like talking about yourself really big or something like that, but uni applications are competitive and it gets more and more competitive every single year. So you need to show the recruiter why you think that you are the best candidate for that limited position. Of course, there's a lot more when it comes to writing a personal statement, like the structuring, how academic it should be, how many references you should include, how to write an opening statement that isn't cringy. But like I said, I'll be making a more detailed video on this later on, so keep an eye out if you're interested. Okay. So when you submit your UCAS application, it's often submitted along with one reference letter that's usually written by your personal tutor or one of your teachers. This, I believe, is almost equally as important as your own personal statement, because I think the UK puts a lot of value on these references, whether it's UCAS applications or job applications, references are really important here in the UK. So if your referee writes rather highly about you and is also really good at writing, you're good. You're not exactly allowed to tell your referee how you want them to write your letter, but it is a good idea to inform them of your grades if they do not teach you, and to also let them sort of know what you do outside of class. Like what are the extracurricular activities that you're involved in, anything that you do outside of school, things like that. This just sort of helps so that they get to know you better as a person rather just than a teacher-student relationship. I'd say for top universities, usually the personal statement would be around 80% academic and 20% non-academic. And because your personal statement has already highlighted most of your academic self, the reference letter that's written by your referee, your teacher, or whatever, that should ideally highlight more of your non-academic side. So maybe any of your unmentioned extracurricular activities, your motivation to study, your diligence, and also some of your personality traits inside and outside the classroom. This sort of gives the recruiter a more holistic view of who you are as a person because the amount of information that you can submit in your UCAS application is quite limited. Like, you can only put your essential information, your grades, personal statement, and this reference letter. You need to make every word count and you don't want to repeat anything. Personally, I was really lucky with my personal tutor who was also my referee who wrote my reference letter. She had connections to a researcher whom she used to do an art collaboration with a few years back, so this helped me to land a very short but valuable internship that I could include in my personal statement as well. She was also a really really good writer, so this was definitely an extra bonus for me. So if you're able to choose your referees, choose wisely. And finally, we come down to the interview process, which is actually a little bit different depending on the course that you apply to. Personally, for my undergraduate application, I was never actually called to an interview, but for my master's application, I was. I've seen a few people post about their imperial interview experience on YouTube, so I've tried to link some of them down below if you're interested in checking them out. And the tips that I'll be mentioning in this video, they aren't really exhaustive or anything like that, but they're just based off my personal experiences and also what I heard from some of my friends from other courses at Imperial. Tip number one is that if you do not know the answer to something, don't say silent, but just talk through your thought process. It's okay not to know the answer to everything, no one does, but what the interviewer is more interested in knowing is just that the way that you work through problems, more than half the time, science is about figuring why things don't work or why they do work. The interview is usually to get to know your approach to problem solving, learning, and also your potential. Of course, that's not to say go in the interview without preparing for any of the actual like academic or knowledge-based things. They definitely look at that as well. They want to know the wealth of information that you know, especially in your subject area, and not just what you study in the textbooks, but sort of how this is relevant to what's going on in the world. So for example, if you're applying for medicine at Imperial, you need to sort of read around this entire COVID pandemic because that is what is relevant right now. Tip number two is that if you have included books or any references that you have read in your personal statement, be sure to actually have read them before the interview. So in general, it's just good to go through everything that you've mentioned in your personal statement and just look into it in a bit more detail just in case they ask you to expand on that during the interview. 
Tip number three is quite generic, but definitely have a good night's rest the night before just to calm your anxiety. Because no matter how many times that we've done an interview, no matter how experienced someone is, you will always feel anxious before an interview. The last thing that you want during an interview is to get all panicky and just have a sudden blackout and just not know what on earth you're saying. So it's difficult, but try to stay calm during the interview and definitely good rest really helps with that. So that's it for this video. I hope hope that you found it somewhat helpful. If you have any questions, just please feel free to leave them in the comment section below. I do try my best to respond to all of the comments. And if you enjoy videos like these, be sure to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!